happy to ask about the Utah Data Center, which is being built by the National Security Agency in the United States, can reportedly collect 60 billion iPhones worth of data. That's five zettabytes. You know what those are, I don't. It's a lot of data. It's going to go online later this year. How should the U.S. approach that? Uh, reportedly, uh, Thomas Drake is an S NSA whistleblower who says they will collect information on Americans. Should we be concerned about that much data in the hands of the government, given the power of the tools you've been talking about? Eric Schmidt? We've gone through, in the industry, we've gone through a series of these proposals, um, and they're often um, somewhat overhyped in terms of what they can actually do. Uh, as I understand it, the NSA's job is uh, essentially for foreign communications. They're not allowed to operate in the United States, but I could be wrong there. That's uh, the law, but the question of whether they're actually following that. No, come on. You can't, you can't ask a theoretical question and assume that the people are sufficiently incompetent. They're not going to follow the law. So I think we have to assume that any activity is legally funded. If it's not illegal, then people should not do it, uh, certainly in America. So assuming that this is a legal activity, um, presumably what they would be doing, and again, I'm speculating, is they'd be assembling some of this information and doing data mining. And the way you would do the data mining is you would look for patterns. Um, so a simple example is that they're looking for people who are racketeering. Well, you know, you'd look for the signals there. And computers are quite good at tracing this. So, I, so far, I've got everybody here in the audience quite, uh, quite upset, right? You're worried about this. You're worried about your civil liberties. Our government does need a certain amount of ability to watch, um, again, legally and correctly against the law, again, in a law, in a democracy, in a rule of law country like the United States. Once those systems are built, they're not turned off. And this, I think, caused us to say, and we indeed say this in the book, that you need to fight for your privacy or you're going to lose it. The Home Secretary calls for broad regulation and surveillance of the internet, right? Not a good thing. So it's easy for governments to overreact and take away your privacy, your security, and so forth in the name of the security. We would say that the open principles, right, the, the, the way in which we work today, is a much, much better way. You'll be ultimately safer with our approach. There's a proposal in California, uh, it's the right to know uh, measure, uh, that would allow citizens in California to request data from organizations so they could know what companies know about them. And that's similar to what exists in Europe. Uh, but the Silicon Valley technology industry has opposed that. Can you tell us about your position on the right to know from consumers how much uh, information companies have about them? Uh, I don't know the specific legislation, so I couldn't comment on it. Google, there's a, a panel that you can get to where not only will show uh, Google what Google knows about you, but you can delete it. Um, and that, I think, is the correct standard. Uh, the general view we have is the information that we collect through our normal course of business with you um, is really for you to control. The biggest U.S. Department of Defense construction project isn't an aircraft carrier or a nuclear missile site. It's a massive data storage facility in Utah. What will be stored there is raising serious questions. In a field in Utah, about a half hour south of Salt Lake City, a massive construction project is wrapping up. When it is completed in a few months, it will be the world's largest repository of digital information. Its owners, the U.S. National Security Agency, the NSA. James Bamford has been writing about the NSA for more than 30 years. All the information will be stored there, and then people at NSA headquarters or at their different listening posts around the world will be able to dip into it. It's called the Utah Data Center, sprawling more than 450,000 square meters with its own power plant, water pumping station to cool the servers, and intense security. It's a key part of the NSA strategy. Gather as much information as possible from as many sources as possible and use it to stop terrorist attacks and create strategic advantages over rival countries. What this is really about is the ability to take a lot of data and learn things that you otherwise can't. And to do that, you need to throw mountains of information at very powerful computers. Where the data is coming from is what concerns privacy advocates. So if I make a phone call, send a text message, do a Google search on my phone, that's information that could end up at this data center in Utah? No, oh, definitely any kind of communication. The NSA declined to provide an on-camera interview, but in a statement says, many unfounded allegations have been made about the planned activities of the data center. One of the biggest misconceptions about NSA is that we are unlawfully listening in on or reading emails of U.S. citizens. This is simply not the case. Right. Yeah, this is the same agency that said they weren't doing that when they were doing the illegal warrantless wiretapping for two and a half years. They were lying to the American public then. They're lying to the American public now. Once collected, the fear is that data stored here could be hacked from outside or leaked by people on the inside. The NSA is one of the most secretive agencies in the U.S. government, with little oversight from Congress. Even its budget is not publicly released. So what data is stored here and where it came from will likely never be fully known. Critics of the NSA say collecting this much data not only has the potential to invade people's privacy, but may be ineffective at stopping terrorist attacks. Intelligence work, they say, is like finding a needle in a haystack, and collecting this much data is simply adding more hay to the stack. And if you keep adding more electronic hay onto the electronic haystack, you're never going to find that electronic needle. And that's what's needed. But there's no sign the NSA or intelligence agencies in other countries are slowing down this hunt for data and information. Is this an arms race for data? Yeah, it's very much an arms race for data. And this data center in Utah is soon to be the United States' biggest weapon in its information arsenal. Jim Spellman, CCTV, Bluffdale, Utah. And the NSA won't say exactly how much information the Utah Data Center will be able to hold, but expects, experts say they can expect it to be about a Yoda byte. To put that into perspective, an iPhone can hold 16 gigabytes. The NSA's new facility will be able to hold the same amount of data as 64 trillion iPhones. Laid end to end, that number of iPhones could stretch to the moon and back over 10,000 times. Quite a bit. For more on the NSA surveillance and for privacy for U.S. citizens, I'm joined by former U.S. Prosecutor Michael Wilds in New York. And Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Um, the NSA, as you know, has virtually no oversight. The same can be said for the U.S. surveillance community overall. The court that is charged with overseeing things like wiretaps answers basically to no one. They operate in secret. Some U.S. lawmakers are seeking to change that now. The White House, of course, resisting that versus persecution. Mr. Snowden is actually saying now that he fears that he'll be persecuted in America for his uh, exposure of this information, when in all truth, 
it looks like he's trying to avoid prosecution. And it's quite laughable, quite honestly. Russia, notorious for denying asylum cases, having only approved maybe 1,500 since 1993 when it accepted a 1951 convention because it is in a laughable position when they are prosecuting people that are dead or political opponents, and now they're going to give a safe haven to somebody who has committed a treasonous act on American soil. Well, so well Michael, let, let, me, uh, let, me, let me jump in here for a second, because you, you keep uh, going back to the treasonable offense. And, and, you know, there's some in the U.S. Congress who like to say that organizations like the NSA and the CIA really have to answer to them. But really, uh, what we saw recently was the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, basically lying under oath about whether the NSA collects data of any kind on millions of Americans. Of course, all of this comes out, and he has to kind of backtrack. Um, he seemingly is not facing any punishment. Uh, what does this tell you about the relationship between Congress and the surveillance agencies? You're talking about treason, but wouldn't that be perjury? 2,200 Russians were granted uh, defensive asylum here over the past decade, meaning Russia wanted most of these people back. The United States said no. Tell me why Edward Snowden shouldn't be seen as someone just like that. If you've ever wondered where the National Security Agency stores all that data it collects, well, you're looking at it. This is the Utah Data Center in Bluffdale, a 92,000 square meter complex completed last September at a cost of one and a half billion dollars. Writer James Bamford has studied the NSA for decades. It's designed to hold a tremendous amount of NSA's intercepted information, the phone calls, the email, the metadata, everything it collects. It needs a place to store it, and that's what uh, Bluffdale is for. It, you could sort of uh, think of it as NSA's external hard drive. The NSA declined a request for an interview, but in Bluffdale, population about 8,000, most people don't have any qualms about their neighbor, the spy agency. It's an important mission. Uh, they uh, get information from around the world, and it's my understanding that they study it here. If you can't trust your government to do the proper thing, what can you trust? But in the wake of former NSA contractor Edward Snowden's revelations, a nationwide movement is building to rein in the NSA, using constitutional powers vested in the states. Connor Boyack is president of the Libertas Institute, a Utah legal think tank. States and cities are not at all required to help the federal government fulfill its various programs and mandates. And so if we wanted to, we could oppose what the NSA is doing. Here in Utah, the NSA's foes think they've found its ultimate weakness. Opponents of the NSA's mass surveillance have come up with an audacious yet perfectly legal plan to cripple the data center. They want the state of Utah to turn off the tap on the NSA's water supply. To keep its equipment from overheating, the center needs nearly 6,500 cubic meters of water a day for a massive cooling system. Legally, Utah could stop the flow. And the result? If the NSA did not have water, it could not cool its servers, and therefore it would not be able to operate its servers. Then, of course, they wouldn't be able to mine and store and sift through all of that data. Activists in Utah plan to put a no cooperation with the NSA bill before the legislature in the near future. Similar laws have been proposed in other states, including California and Washington. It is to establish a policy in the state that the state or any of its political subdivisions wouldn't provide, you know, we won't provide support, material support, assistance, um, any of those things to um, any agency that is uh, collecting data, um, doing mass surveillance or anything like that. But clearly this is targeted at the NSA Obviously, data center, yes. so yep. why? Uh, well, I mean, it boils down to the Fourth Amendment uh, for me. Um, clearly the, the mass collection of data and surveillance uh, by the, the Utah data center is a sensitive and important subject and, and matter. Uh, but for me, it, you know, the Fourth Amendment is clear. Um, it simply states that uh, unreasonable search and seizure uh, uh, and, and without a warrant you know, of our persons, our property, our homes, our documents, our effects. Clearly, the mass surveillance and, and data collection that they're doing is being done without a warrant, uh, with, without any of these things. And so you know, it's, it's left to the states, uh, I think, in times like these and other times, too, when the federal government gets too big to take action. Uh, I think as Justice Roberts in the ACA decision said, the states are sovereign and independent um, uh, uh, not being sovereign and independent, sometimes have to act like it. And there's, you know, 13 other states acting like it, um, moving in this direction. Is that where you got your inspiration, looking at what other states are doing, or um, sure, yeah. did it come out of the after effects of the Edward Snowden? Well, obviously, a lot of this came out of the after effect of the Edward Snowden revelations. Um, uh, and then a lot of states started moving in this direction and said, hey, what can we do together, you know, to combat this? We don't see the federal government moving anytime soon to uh, pull back. Um, on its spying of U on U.S. citizens and, and others. And so it's uh, a move by the states to balance and check uh, those powers. And with the Obama administration wrestling over reforming the NSA surveillance program, state lawmakers across the country are taking measures into their own hands. This is an incredible story. And as John Blackstone reports, one proposal in Utah would dry up a lot more than support for the NSA. National Security Agency's largest such facility in the country. If one Utah state lawmaker gets his way, it will also be the driest. The federal government can spy and collect all this data if it wants, but as a state, we don't have to support it. The new NSA data center in Utah requires 1.7 million gallons of water every single day. Mark Roberts is drafting a bill that would cut off state water to the facility, which needs it to cool its huge banks of computer servers. The legislation would also prohibit state universities from working with the NSA as long as it continues to collect phone records and data on millions of Americans. The policy in the state would be that we won't provide any material support or assistance in any way to the data center. 
Utah is just one of 15 states considering bills to deny local resources to NSA facilities. Michael Bolden's nonpartisan think tank wrote the model legislation most of these proposals are based on. The legislation basically says, hey, the state is not going to participate in helping the federal government spy on people in the United States or around the world without a warrant. Last month, President Obama laid out a path to reform for the NSA data collection program. The reforms I'm proposing today should give the American people greater confidence that their rights are being protected. Yet state lawmakers are still trying to impact the agency at their level. The bills are all in the very early stages, and their chances of passage are uncertain. But their author's messages are coming across loud and clear. Turn it off. Collecting secret information. But should the utility bill there be secret too? A state records committee will now decide if the NSA's water bill should be public knowledge. Chris Miller joins us now live. And Chris, why is it so important that we know exactly how much water they're using? Yeah, guys, according to the NSA, if you're able to figure out how much water they're using on a daily basis, you would also be able to figure out how much data they're storing and collecting. That's something the NSA does not want you to know. I don't fully understand the rationale for not disclosing the water. I know the reason they've given it doesn't quite make sense to me. This is Nate Carlisle, a reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune. He's going before the State Records Committee in perhaps the last chapter of his quest to obtain water usage data from the NSA facility in Bluffdale. The city of Bluffdale entered into an agreement with the NSA when the federal agency came to town. Bluffdale is providing water at a discounted rate, under the assumption that the city will keep that information private. Here's a statement from Bluffdale to the State Records Committee. The Department of Defense communicated verbally to the city of Bluffdale that all information pertaining to the Utah Data Center should be kept confidential because it related to national security issues or was otherwise protected under federal law. Bluffdale has honored that agreement, but Mr. Carlisle is fighting the city because he believes that information should be available to the public. Public dollars is certainly something we account for in Utah, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of money exchanging hands between Bluffdale and the NSA in this deal. A bill filed in the Utah State House yesterday would deny critical resources like water to the massive NSA data center there should it pass. House Bill 150, introduced by Representative Mark Roberts, would require that the water being supplied to the NSA's data center in Bluffdale be shut off as soon as the city's $3 million bond is paid off. Early reports indicated that the NSA would need up to 1.7 million gallons of cooling water each day to keep their supercomputers functional, but those resources are still required to keep the data center operational. Back in 2006, the NSA maxed out the electricity available at the Baltimore area power grid, leading insiders to fear a virtual shutdown of the agency due to lack of resources. This, in part, pushed the agency into a long search to diversify their facilities in places like Utah, Texas, and elsewhere. Since Congress and the President have so far refused to take any steps to limit federal surveillance powers, Robert's bill is seen by some supporters as the last stand. And with similar bills already introduced in Alaska, Washington State, Missouri, Indiana, and South Carolina, with more states to come on board soon, their goal is to box them in and shove the spying down. If you trust the government is going to do the right thing, I think you're alone in that respect. In November 2015, the National Security Agency lost the ability to directly hold information about the phone calls of millions of U.S. citizens. This was all thanks to the USA Freedom Act passed last summer. But don't get too comfortable. While the change is significant, the NSA can still collect and store your communication from the internet and social media. So all those selfies you've been taking and all those online chats with friends? Yeah, the NSA may have them stored up somewhere. It's hard to say where they store them, but in the future they'll be stored here in these nondescript concrete buildings in the sleepy town of Bluffdale, Utah. We asked the NSA if they could show us around the complex, but were probably turned down because the site is a secure facility. They may have understandably been a little spooked since Edward Snowden revealed all that spying on Americans that they were involved in. The NSA data center is primarily server space, where they have large rooms with racks of servers. That's Pete Ashton of X-Mission, an internet service provider in Salt Lake City. Before Snowden revealed massive spying by the NSA in 2013, Ashton was able to get a tour of what was inside those concrete buildings, and he may be one of the only people to talk about what he saw publicly. What did you see? How did you even get an invitation to go? X-Mission is part of Utah Data Center Consortium, which was started by an individual at the University of Utah. The University of Utah, of course, has their own data center, and they wanted to get together to share ideas and, and best practices. The data center consortium includes University of Utah, eBay, Oracle, and it also includes the NSA. And I think the NSA participates, you know, just to be friendly and uh, probably to recruit because whenever there's a thing at the University of Utah where we're talking data centers, they go up and they want to talk to the students to tell them what they do and what a great job it is to work for the NSA. So they made that invitation in uh, fall of uh, 2012 and, uh, you know, I heard it was a great facility and I wanted to check it out. So you walk in and what do you walk around and see on this tour? It was still under construction at that point. I saw a lot of people pulling cable. They loaded us into a van and, and drove us around. First we saw the facility kind of like from above and they, they pointed out how it's divided into two facilities that are redundant with each other. The questions they would answer were, were very banal, but we were able to calculate the capacity just by counting the generators. Each of those generators was like a two megawatt generator and they had over 30 of them, I think. Oh, wow. That's a lot of power. It is a huge amount of power. I, I think a megawatt can service a thousand homes. The tour guide said that one of the reasons they wanted to build the data center in Utah was because of the patriotism of uh, people from Utah. Yeah, that was one of my questions is, uh, you know, why, why did you come here? And his response was, the electricity is cheap and the people are patriotic. And I, I read that as a code word is that nobody's going to ask any questions. And, you know, that, that kind of sat with me uneasily. That it, In my opinion, uh, patriotism is questioning your government uh, consistently. The idea that we're just sheep out here and we're not going to care, I think is, you know, even though we're a very conservative state, I think a lot of people would bristle at that idea. Okay, so they put the pillowcase back on your head and you leave the facility, 
What did you think after leaving the facility? What like mold in your head? I'd always heard the myths that the NSA could read hard drives and uh, crack all encryptions. And, you know, I asked them about that and they just kind of laughed that off. But as the days went on and I thought more about the facility and I thought more about what Mark Klein had revealed in uh, 2004, he would reveal that in the AT&T data center in the Bay Area that the NSA had an interceptor room where all the data flowing through AT&T at that point was going in and nobody knew what was going on inside. Now, that was something else that was interesting about the tour is I asked, well, where's your internet connection? Do you have a connection to the internet at all? And they said, this building is not connected to the internet. So they have intercept points around the country that I think they pull data off of those intercept points and put them on their own private network. They definitely have fiber going into that building, but I think it's completely uh, air-gapped from the internet. I started to realize that it's just a data collection point, that they're collecting and storing as much data off the internet and telephone networks that they can. And they think that if you ask for a warrant later to look at the data, that's okay. Even with everything that Snowden revealed, do you think that the average American really understands bulk data collection from the NSA? Absolutely not. I think it's a very hard thing for most Americans to understand exactly that their data is being intercepted and stored. And a lot of people would say, well, I'm not a criminal, I don't have a problem with it. Well, the thing you have to realize is you may not be a criminal, but giving that data to other people and trusting them with it, there could be criminals on the other side. If you trust the government is going to do the right thing, I think you're alone in that respect. The other space program insider who we could call Jacob was that, and this is going to be hard for people to accept, and I'm interested to see what you're going to say about this. He said that they, that the Draco had a very vast AI system that was monitoring the consciousness of everyone on Earth, so that if we start thinking in the direction that they don't want us to think, that we'll start feeling tired, exhausted, uh, we'll get distracted, we'll want to do something else, we might have a panic attack, we might suddenly become sexually aroused and say, well, enough of this, I want to go look at hot models on the internet. And that everybody has what they call a file, which is the electronic record of all the thoughts and how these various strategies work, and that that was one of the things that they built this vast NSA facility for in Bluffdale, Utah, is to store the files. And apparently it was not just the files for people on Earth, but there's enough computer power there, he said, the Draco were storing files on several other planets in our vicinity. Um, I'm curious if you heard about this Draco mainframe that nudges people into becoming really tired and starting to like pass out if they encounter this information. Well, that this Draco mainframe, what I'm tying in together here is if they're AI prophets, they're working with this ETE extra dimensional AI threat, then this could be the same thing. Yeah. And this is a, it's, it's, it is a major threat. I've sat with Jacob and with uh, Pete Peterson. I've asked these guys certain questions and they will literally pass out in the middle of answering the question. You just, they, they lose consciousness. And what they told me was that, well, what Jacob told me was that this technology is intended to make it very difficult for you to continue thinking when, this, when you start getting into the truth and the information. This also has to do if you have an AI signal infection. Uh, there are different types of things that will keep you, like, you know, I had certain knowledge that they were unable to blank slate me with, but uh, through different entity attachments or, or if they have AI attachments, they can manage people to where uh, if they try to talk about something, they have anxiety attacks or they get really sleepy, right. that kind of thing. So they have ways of managing people that they can't totally shut up or, or blank slate their memories.